So welcome everyone. Today we're uh, privileged to have Rahul Krishnan, who's going to be telling us about machine learning for healthcare disease progression modeling. So uh, Rahul, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Manolis. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful uh, to be here to present some of the work that we've been doing at the intersection of machine learning uh, and healthcare. So my name is Rahul. I'm currently a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England, which is uh, typically, if you were all at MIT, would be down the road. Uh, but since we're all in different places, uh, it, I'm currently presenting to you remotely. And in the fall, I'll be an assistant professor in CSM Medicine at the University of Toronto. So I want to give you an overview of what this talk is going to be about. Um, I'm going to start with some introduction, uh, just about the field of machine learning in healthcare. Over the, over the past semester, you've all seen different kinds of researchers present their work. Um, you know, spanning a wide array of different topics. And so uh, I'll mention to you what this intersectional work is based on. Um, and then I'm going to give you a vignette that's going to form the bulk of this talk of a, of a specific niche in the context of machine learning for healthcare called disease progression modeling. So I'll give you some motivation, what the problem statement is. I'll talk to you a bit about deep generative modeling in this context. And, uh, and finally present some work that's going to be shown at ICML this year. And so I'll conclude as well as highlight some of the opportunities that I think exist in this field for intersectional research. And I think this class sort of gives you a really good uh, breadth of topics that make you well prepared to think about some of these issues that are going to be raised. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump in. Um, if we look at, and you know, this, this plot is a bit outdated now, but if we look at this plot that tracks the digitization of electronic health record data, just in the United States from starting from 2008 to 2015. Um, what you'll see is that there was a meteoric rise in the number of hospitals in the US that adopted electronic medical record systems. Uh, and what that meant, and this was you know, largely driven by administrative pressures, which is to say that people wanted better ways to track spending in hospital systems. And so the government incentivized this process to come about. But there was a really interesting consequence of this which is that people began asking, hey, we have so much data about patients right now. We have data about medical imaging, we have data about inpatient health monitoring, we have the exams that uh, these patients undertook. We even have mobile phones that track uh, specific details about our own health, as well as lab results. Can we do interesting things with this data? And so, uh, this field of machine learning for healthcare began asking these questions. And I think in broad strokes, some of the work that's already been done in the field is about thinking through unsupervised learning of the data, which is to say, I have a large data set, I'm going to investigate this data set and understand the kinds of substructure that exists in the data. And it's feasible that this substructure is interesting or predictive of clinically relevant outcomes in the future. And so this is an example in the context of studying um, data from breast cancer patients. Another alternative use case for uh, all of this data that's now being collected in hospitals is about building tools to aid clinicians. And so in this picture, you have a doctor who's, uh, who you can think of as perhaps using a machine learning guided assistive tool to better help their clinical workers. And so, as people began asking and answering really interesting questions with this data, there's also a different kind of data set that a, a different modality of data that began being released by a large number of nonprofit organizations. And those are often called disease registries. So in a hospital, you can think of the data set as spanning a wide variety of people and individuals with different kinds of diseases all lumped together. Disease registries are much more focused data sets. So they're typically released um, by foundations or nonprofits who are interested in allowing researchers like all of you to study and answer interesting questions in the context of a single disease. And so not a lot of people perhaps uh, know about disease registry. So I wanted to give this uh, you know, figure here to give you what a cartoon depiction of what a registry might look like. So uh, on the left-hand side, you often tend to have for every individual in your registry, some set of baseline characteristics. This could be demographic information, this could be genetic information, RNA sequencing data, and a set of baseline lab vitals and biomarkers. Often for disease registries, 
we have access to longitudinal data. That is data that exists for patients over time. And so on the top right block, what you see are examples of what treatments typically look like. So in this case, this patient had two drugs that were given to him, sometimes in combination, sometimes in isolation over the course of their treatment. And what you see at the top of this plot, line one, line two, line three plus, is an internal facet of how a lot of chronic diseases are treated, which is to say it is a clinical protocol that is adopted by clinicians and that is evident in disease registries. So for example, what doctors will often do, particularly when treating cancers, is that they will start with a what's known as a first line of therapy, which is to say, what does a clinical protocol tell me I should do when a new patient comes in with a cancer? And so, you know, you, you have this patient who uh, for several time steps goes through for, uh, line one of treatment, which constitutes a certain set of combinations of drugs or treatments. Perhaps, they, perhaps these treatments don't work out so well for this patient. And so they progress onto line two. And so line two is, generally denoted to be either a more aggressive form of treatment or a different kind of treatment altogether. And finally, they progress onto line three. And so these, you can think of these lines as being approximate strategies that clinicians employ when they're treating patients in hospital for a single disease. And disease registries often track these to, to help uh, to give researchers an idea of where the patient is in, during the course of their treatment. And finally, at the bottom are lab results. So I presented you a cartoon depiction of what one of these biomarkers might look like. And these lab results go up, they go down. Uh, and for patients who are sick, they might miss one or two of their doctor's appointments. And so those values are denoted in red. And so this data is uh, interesting. It contains a lot of rich phenotypic information about the patient, but it's often incredibly messy to deal with because one has to deal with issues such as messiness. So this is just to give you a bit of a lay of the land in terms of what is a disease registry, what can I expect to find in a disease registry, and uh, what the data looks like. And so what I'm going to present to you today is uh, works that, work that's going to be published at ICML this year, and it's talking about how can we build statistical models that can model the kind of data that I showed you in the previous slide. And these kinds of models are known as disease progression models. I should you know, state up front that this is a very old field and that it has existed for decades and decades in different communities under different names. It, it by no means am I claiming that you know, this is the first work to do this. Um, and, so if you were, if you, uh, and so if you were to look up disease progression modeling in bioinformatics, uh, there's a rich history of people doing this with a variety of diseases uh, over the years. And from, a, from the perspective of machine learning, one way in which this problem has been posed is that of unsupervised learning. So let's take again the cartoon depiction of the data that we have, and let's start putting names to some of these random variables that we're going to think about modeling. So on the left-hand side, we have the static baseline covariates that I'm going to refer to as B. And uh, in the top and the bottom, we have the longitudinal data. I'm going to refer, I'm going to use X to refer to the time varying longitudinal biomarkers. I've only shown a picture of one here, but in practice, um, these registries track many, many different biomarkers simultaneously for a single patient at a time. So X is typically high dimensional. And at the top, we have treatments, the use that are going to be prescribed to the patient. And this includes both their line of therapy as well as the individual drugs that they were. So as I mentioned before, that one way in which disease progression modeling is often posed as a learning problem is that of unsupervised learning of these clinical biomarkers. And specifically, uh, models are often designed and built to maximize this conditional probability distribution. So what is this? Let's just break it down. So we wanna maximize over the set of all patients, the log probability for every patient I of observing the longitudinal sequence of their clinical biomarkers condition both on their baseline treatments, as well as a sequence of uh, treatment, sorry, condition both on their baseline statistics, as well as the sequence of interventions or uh, treatments that they've been given over there. Great. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you about 
tackling the problem that we saw earlier, that of doing conditional density estimation as disease progression modeling in the context of multiple myeloma. So for those of you who uh, might not be familiar with it, multiple myeloma is a rare cancer of the bone marrow. And um, its incidence rate in the population, regardless of which country you look at, is going to be incredibly, uh, incredibly low. And so the, as a consequence, this is, uh, as a consequence of the fact that this is a very rare disease, we often have a very small number of samples to learn from. And so that's really what's unique about this disease and what drove us to think about how do we do good modeling and good density estimation when we're working with data from rare diseases. In addition, uh, in addition to the fact that the number of samples is low, we have to deal with the traditional suite of challenges and that come with working with healthcare data. So the first one is the fact that we have this high dimensional longitudinal data X that's observed at different points in time, and it exhibits a nonlinear degree of variation. We have to deal with the fact that there's missingness in X and we need a, uh, we need a good way to be able to handle this missingness. Um, I won't go deep into this, but uh, clinical data often has a fair degree of left and right censorship. To tell you what right censorship means, it means that at any point during uh, any given study or during the patient's observation period, they may choose to withdraw consent. They may say, I, I'm not comfortable with having my data being released to researchers anymore. And so at that point and onwards, we have no more information about that patient. So that's effectively missing. And this special form of missingness is often referred to as, as right censorship. And equivalently, there's uh, uh, cases where you have left censorship as well. And finally, the variation that we have in X is driven not just by what the past history of the biomarker was, but also what the treatment schedule that the patient is on. So I'm going to touch on some of these challenges in what I present to you today, but I want to give you a heads up on this is often uh, um, some of the unique challenges that uh, show up in healthcare data. And I imagine in all of your past guest lectures, as you thought through and looked at different data modalities, different kinds of challenges come up. But I think thinking hard and tackling some of these challenges is perhaps some of the most interesting, is where some of the most interesting research gets done. So um, if we were to you know, take off our data hats and put on our modeling hats now, and we ask the question, we want to do conditional density estimation. What are the tools that we have at our disposal to tackle this problem effectively? Well, um, perhaps uh, some subset of you might have taken a class on machine learning or deep learning and would say, well, we have high dimensional data that's nonlinear. Uh, maybe we can try modeling the uh, conditional probability distribution with a recurrent neural network. And so I've shown you the, a graphical model for what that might look like on the left, where the probability of X given mu uh, comma B is modeled by this autoregressive density function in the bottom left. Um, another set of you might say, uh, well, I think we should think a little harder and perhaps we should go with a simpler class of models like a hidden Markov model or a Gaussian or its continuous time, uh, a continuous um, uh, cousin, the Gaussian state space model. And so that's another possible option um, and uh, that one can consider using for this kind of data. And so I've written the equation for a Gaussian state space model as to how it models the density of the sequence at the bottom right. Well, in both of these cases, um, one question might be, uh, is a linear model sufficient to model the data? And so, in some of the work that we've looked at in the past, we found that in order to model the nonlinear uh, density of longitudinal biomarkers, one might need to resort to nonlinear uh, models to begin with. And so what I've shown you here is a pictorial depiction of a deep Markov model, which is essentially like a hidden Markov model, except for the fact that the emission function and the transition function, which are these two functions that parameterize how the latent state evolves, as well as how the observations behave as a function of the latent states are parameterized by neural networks. And so we're gonna pause here for a second to just look through what uh, this model does and how it behaves. And so, uh, so at the top left, you have um, the equation that surrounds how the conditional density of data is going to be represented by this model. So it's this integral over this high dimensional vector Z over all time of the conditional probability of 
the uh, variation in z over time multiplied by the conditional probability of the observations um, given the latent variable. And so the you know, story by which data is generated is the fact that you start at the left, at left side with z1. Some, you believe that data is generated by the following process. Uh, z1 represents some low dimensional vector, um, which generates x1, your initial set of observations. Then the doctor comes in and perhaps prescribes a set of medicine. Uh, and so your latent uh, representation of the patient changes to Z2. And that change is governed by what we're going to call the transition function. Z2 produces its own set of observations, X2. And the doctor prescribes yet another set of medication, U2, uh, which governs how Z3 behaves. And I'll, I'll say uh, out front that, uh, at least in this talk, I won't go very, very deep into uh, the details of how this model is actually learned, and you can look at the reference below to uh, understand that. But I'll just say that it's uh, parameter estimation, which is the parameters of the neural networks that govern each of the equations in this model are learned by maximum likelihood. And we're going to use variational inference with an inference network for approximating the uh, intractable posterior distribution. Because remember, this is a latent variable model, and we need to ha have some way of approximating the, uh, the posterior distribution in order to do um, uh, parameter estimation. Rahul, could I ask you a question? So okay. <clears throat> uh, depending on the type of variable that you're measuring, the observations might be conditional on the doctor's expectation that that variable be abnormal. Yeah, so, so that's a great particular question. Particular tests are only prescribed when you expect them to be abnormal, otherwise you don't subject the patients to that test. Yeah. And that also means that when you have missing data, you can't expect the distribution of the missing data to match the distribution of the observed data. Yeah. I'm curious yeah. whether that's even incorporatable in this type yeah. of model where you have the non-missing at random component. Um, so I'll answer the first question first, uh, which was about the fact that the you want, for example, in this picture that we have here, u2 is going to be a function of what x1 is, which is to say the choice of, uh, sorry, uh, of what x1 and x2 is, which is to say the choice of what the doctor chooses to do next is going to depend on what values the clinical biomarkers that, um, uh, that are taken by x1 and x2. So that and gives so you the opportunity to have dependencies between observation and actual value. Yeah. And so this is a great point, and it's not something we deal with here because of the fact that we're going to always assume that we have access to the U's over time, which is to say we're going to condition on the treatment plan that is going to be decided uh, for the patient. Ah, perfect. So um, you can think of an imaginary edge existing between X1, X2, and U2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, but un unless you think about U2 being latent, you don't actually have to learn that edge because conditioning on U2 blocks any influence from uh, X1 and X2 on how the subsequent biomarkers behaves. Got it, thank you. Okay, and so, um, sorry, did that answer the first question okay? I, yeah, I mean, it was a combined bigger question, but yes. Okay, uh, so th the question of missingness is a great one. And um, to some degree, I think my first response addresses it, but to another degree, I think uh, this, model is interesting to use with missing data because typically the process of maximum likelihood estimation requires you to marginalize out missing data yeah, uh, yeah. when you don't observe it. And marginalization in this class of uh, deep generative models is easy because it effectively reverts back to ignoring the loss term associated with the missing variables. There's a small subtlety here that I'd like to point out, which is the fact that if you're doing variational inference with an inference network, you do need to condition on your data to parameterize an approximate posterior distribution, which is to say you're going to condition on missing data. And in those scenarios, in the inference network, I think uh, in this work, we use a variety of heuristics to approximate the missing data. And uh, like we use mean fill as well as just forward filling the values to approximate the missing data, but I, I don't yet have a very good answer for um, how to deal with missing data when um, working with this class of models in the context of the inference network yet. So I think there's interesting research to be done in studying how missingness affects the bias of the variational posterior distribution and as a consequence affects the parameters learned. But um, 
I, I haven't seen a lot of uh, uh, work tackling specifically that problem. Okay. So, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to give maybe a pictorial representation of, you know, how this model works as uh, just to ground this because we're going to uh, work with this class of models in the remainder of this lecture. So let's say the doctor sees the following set of clinical observations for the patient. At this point in time, the doctor says everything is normal and says, uh, I don't really feel comfortable prescribing any medication. Um, you know, three months go by, the patient comes in again, you see one of the biomarkers and one of the other biomarkers is missing because that test was not ordered at the clinic. The doctor says, this looks a bit off to me, I'm going to prescribe you this medication. Um, Three months later, patient comes in again and has the following set of lab values in terms of their clinical observations. The doctor says, I think I need to make a more uh, um, intense intervention at this point, and, but the patient doesn't respond to it. So this story of how the patient and the doctor interact is modeled through this latent representation that changes over time. So hopefully this diagram gives you an illustration of how the conditional density of data is being modeled through variation and changes in the latent representation. And so our hypothesis is that we can view this Z that changes over time as a sufficient statistic for the high dimensional patient vector and perhaps a proxy for their underlying case, uh, patient state. Okay, so what did we do in the last few slides? We said, we started out by saying, we have this problem and we wanna model the conditional density of clinical data. Well, we talked about some tools to do that. On the left-hand side, we have some more, uh, we have recurrent neural networks and deep Markov models that are powerful black box models for sequencing. However, one of the concerns that has been observed in practice is the fact that they're susceptible to overfitting when data is scarce, which we said it is because multiple myeloma the disease we care about is a rare disease. On the right-hand side, we have more traditional families of models like state space models and HMMs that are linear and have a rich history of being used in the context of disease progression. However, we know that the underlying dynamics that govern how some of these clinical biomarkers behaves is nonlinear. So the question that we ask in this work is, is there a middle ground? Can we use domain knowledge to effectively design deep generative models for clinical data? And so, um, the reason why we went that route is the idea that if we incorporate the right set of domain knowledge into the model, we might hope to help it generalize better. So this leads us to the next question. For clinical data, and in particular for ca cancer progression, what is the right domain knowledge to use? So in this work, we focused on two types of domain knowledge. One is about the lines of therapy, and the other one is about capturing the mechanism of drug effect. And so uh, the next question is, well, if we had this knowledge uh, about how these two aspects of the model behave, how do we use it? And so in this work, we focused on the designing a new, a new neural architecture for the transition function. So if you think back to the equation of the state-based model, it's effectively this function mu that we're going to be uh, playing around with. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm, I pulled back my cartoon depiction of registry data. And what I'm showing here are how the treatments behave over time. Well, there's two things to point out here. Uh, and we're going to focus on the lines of therapy to start with. You'll notice that the lines of therapy approximate how long the patient has been on treatment. So to capture that, we're going to augment our uh, treatment representation with what's called a global clock, which is just going to be a normalized counter that says, how long have I been on treatment for this disease? In addition, you'll notice that these lines of therapy change from different points in time. And so we're going to augment the treatment representation with these local clocks, which effectively tell you how much time has elapsed until a major progression event uh, has happened to the patient. So, they, so these local clocks capture time relative to a progression event. Next, we're going to think about how to approximate the mechanistic effect of drugs. So on the left-hand side is again, this cartoon picture of the data that we have. And one of the biomarkers for 
two distinct points in time. We hypothesize that one of the ways in which doctors actually treat patients is they ask, well, how much do I think, uh, what do I think the tumor burden of this patient is? And this, a lot of this is from conversations that we've had with an oncologist at MGH in, uh, in terms of working with this uh, data set. And so he says, well, I try to think about um, uh, how much disease burden there is, and that in some ways guides the amount of treatment that I prescribe. And so intuitively, the scarping depiction of these cancerous cells here, uh, we expect that the treatment is going to uh, have some underlying effect on the size of these cancerous cells that exist for patients with multiple myeloma. The issue, however, is that we never observe the size of the cancer directly. We only observe them at, through the clinical biomarkers that we actually have access to in the registry data set. So what we're going to do is come up with an approximate uh, function that approximates the mechanistic effect of the drugs that are being prescribed by the doctor at every point in time. And mind you, it's not just a single drug that's being prescribed. Typically for cancerous treatments, you're prescribed this cocktail of drugs. We need to approximate the effect of this cocktail if we, have, uh, if we need to um, capture the effect that it's having on the underlying patient's tumor. And so to capture that approximate effect, we turn to a different branch of um, science that, that exactly deals with these kinds of issues. And that's pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So both of these are subfields of pharmacology that are associated with developing mathematical models, uh, particularly dynamical models of how drugs behave in the lab when prescribed uh, one at a time to a uh, tumor. So for, uh, to give you a concrete example of this, uh, one of the classical models of uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics is the log cell model. And it's essentially a hypothesis that says that if I prescribe X amount of drugs, I expect a logarithmic fraction of my cancer cells to die. And so this hypothesis is encoded in a mathematical formula. And the study of these mathematical formulas is known, it, uh, is encompassed within this field. And so a limitation of traditional PKPD models is that they're designed to model the dynamics associated with a single biomarker due to the intervention of a single drug. But that's not exactly what we want because we want to understand how these cocktails of drugs behave uh, when they're given to patients jointly. And so in our work, we've proposed three different neural architectures to model the effect of simultaneous interventions on latent representations. And so um, I've presented to you the formulas here, which aren't um, and the paper goes into a lot more detail about what these formula are. And since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip through the details here. But each of them is designed to capture a different aspect of how the patient's genetics or their treatments behave. Um, and they're inspired by different kinds of pharmacokinetic models. Um, and so by designing these neuro different neural architectures, we can then combine them using an attention mechanism to create a single function mu. So remember, our goal was to do conditional density estimation. We said that current models overfit, so we might need some kind of domain knowledge to help them along the way. The kind of domain knowledge that we created was to design these three new neural PKPD functions, G1, G2, and G3, that are inspired from the literature on PKPD modeling. And in order to incorporate them into the model, we need to de define them in the context of this transition function which decides how the latent state of the deep Markov model evolves as a function of treatments being prescribed. So this slide captures the story perhaps from where we started to where we've ended up in the design of this model. And so we're gonna call this model the SSN PKP. And we're going to apply this model to a cohort of multiple myeloma patients. So we have about a thousand patients in our cohort and each of them is treated according to the current standard of care. So we have about 16 clinical biomarkers over time. We have nine indications of treatments and we have 16 baseline features. And so they, uh, uh, they include uh, the, the PCA projections of some of the patient's RNA, SNP data, as well as demographic information about the patient. So for baselines, we study four of the following baselines for the following reasons. 
SSM linear is a linear state space model, and it's uh, it's designed to mimic some of the popular choices that have been used in the literature literature to model the conditional density of clinical data. SSM nonlinear corresponds to using just a neural network in the transition function. SSM MOE corresponds to a state space model whose transition function is parameterized via a mixture of experts. So a mixture of experts is a uh, now it's a pretty old uh, neural architecture that's effectively designed to trade off between different uh, neural networks, each of which is encouraged to learn a different function approximation. What this baseline is going to tell us is uh, how much of a benefit are we really getting from incorporating domain knowledge into, the, into G1, G2, and G3 versus letting the data decide what that functional form should be on its own. And finally, we compare against SSM attention history, which is a re-implementation of the state space model, model in Alain van der Schaar, and uh, is, a, is a really interesting paper that I encourage you all to read on how to do disease progression modeling with uh, autoregressive uh, deep generative models. And so I'll highlight some of the results here. So in the top chart, what we see are the results on held out data where the number described tells you the negative variational lower bound. So a lower number indicates that the model has generalized better to new data. So in the top case, we wanted to be able to vary the training set size to see the uh, effect of how the number of samples that the model is used to learn from affects generalization. And so we use the semi-synthetic data for it. Um, but what we see here is that across the board, um, in, uh, against both linear and non-linear baselines, the use of SSMPKPD seems to create models that uh, generalize better. And in the bottom chart is on actual multiple myeloma patients, we did a pairwise comparison between the models, which is to say for these two pairs of models, how well do they, um, uh, how well do they perform on data that the model has never seen before? And so we, counted the number of patients for which the PKPD model had a uh, better held out negative log likelihood um, against each of the different points of comparison that we had. And so one you know, obvious question is to say, you've created this model and you've put a lot of parameters into it. Are the benefits that you see purely due to the fact that you have so many parameters? Are you just putting the data better? Um, and the answer to that is not always uh, yes, because the SSM MOE, for example, has many, many more parameters than the SSM PKPD, but overfits rapidly. And so I think this gave us some degree of confidence that the choice of functional forms is particularly important to being able to model the dynamics of this kind of data well. So we did an ablation analysis to try and understand where the gains that we see in terms of generalization were actually coming from. So recall that I said we had about um, uh, 16 clinical biomarkers. And so for each biomarker, we uh, pulled out the negative log likelihood that's obtained by important sampling from the different models and studied how well they did. And so we see that some of the gains come, I, I think, you know, for us, this chart was interesting. And when we showed it to some of our clinical collaborators, they found it interesting as well, because they said that um, it, uh, some of the ways in which the, um, the model explains um, the serum IgG, for example, um, is what they would expect in terms of biomarkers that have a fair degree of nonlinearity in their behavior over time. And um, this is an ablation analysis that I think for the purposes of time, I will skip through, but it's verifying the utility of the local and global clocks that we incorporated into the model. Um, this was an interesting experiment that we tried. So recall that I said that this deep generative model has a latent space. The latent space uh, can be introspected uh, separately uh, after training the model to try and understand how are the dynamics that are implicitly being learned by the model, uh, how do they behave and what do they depend upon? And so what this chart is showing where each point in the charts is a training data point and the colors represent whether the patient was on line one, line two or line three. Uh, this, this chart is showing the progression of how the latent states of multiple patients behave 
And we're currently working to try and understand with doctors why we have this two separate cluster structure that changes over time and merges into one as patients go through uh, therapy. This is um, an example of uh, just using the model as is for uh, forecasting what the uh, future of a patient might look like. So in this case, we only gave the model access to the baseline biomarkers. And we said, can you forecast what will happen to the clinical biomarkers if you were to run the model forward in time? Um, and what we see here is that there's a greater fit, and this is most perhaps most visible in the context of serum lambda, to the data um, relative to a linear baseline when using uh, SSM to JP. And I think we observe the same phenomena when we condition on a fraction of the patient's clinical data and ask both of these models to sample forward in time. What this tells us is that these latent representations that are being captured by SSMPKPD retain some history about the patient's state that's relevant for predicting future uh, clinical biomarkers as well. Okay, so um, this is maybe a good time to uh, wrap up. I think. Um, if you were to take away anything from this talk, I, I've tried to compress it and summarize it here, which is, the, which is to say that we started out with the goal of how do we do good conditional density estimation when we have nonlinear time varying data coming from patients. The challenge is that data is scarce and sometimes missing, and traditional methods either overfit or are insufficiently expressive. The approach that we've experimented it with in this paper is to think really deeply about what is it about this data uh, that we can use in order to make the model's job simpler. So we've incorporated domain knowledge in how interventions affect latent representation to improve generalization. And so we've taken ideas from pharmac uh, pharmacodynamic modeling, as well as ideas from the clinical treatment protocols that doctors often use to treat chronic diseases. And this resulted in a new model that we've studied uh, the generalization of in the context of a patient suffering from multiple myeloma. And so if we zoom out and ask, what are the lessons that maybe uh, uh, apply from this work to other projects or other research areas of interest uh, that may have been presented here or that you may be interested in thinking about for your own projects? So one of this is that when thinking of building and designing deep generative models, it's worthwhile to think deeply about both how the data was generated as well as talk to domain experts to try and understand what about their knowledge can be incorporated into the model directly so that the model can not waste modeling capacity on learning that. And it can focus on some of the more interesting aspects of the data. So what's future work, at least as, this, as far as this work goes, we're currently validating our results in a much larger independent cohort. And we're working with researchers from the Veterans Association to do this, um, sorry, the Veterans Affairs Hospitals. Um, we're, we're, we're thinking about how to make use of this model to develop clinical decision support tools. And so this involves talking to oncologists to see what their clinical workflow is like, understanding what biomarkers make the most sense uh, for them to know ahead of time uh, the, uh, the behavior of so that they might use it, for example, to change their uh, treatment protocols. And so what I presented here is a purely predictive model. That is, we're doing conditional density estimation. An interesting question I don't, that I don't think is necessarily feasible using the current cohort that we have, but may be feasible using a much larger cohort, is thinking about how to uh, in, in, improve the model so that it's able to do counterfactual reasoning, which is to say, how does uh, changing the treatment at you know, uh, halfway through the uh, patient's timeline change the downstream outcomes that they exhibit? And we can also think about how to incorporate this model uh, within the inner loop of uh, a model-based reinforcement learning framework. So um, I wanna highlight some of the opportunities and research that exist just as a final thought. Um, I've pointed out um, one specific niche in the bigger picture of machine learning for healthcare. And in this case, it was doing conditional density estimation on clinical data. There's a wider variety of uh, research questions about how to forecast patient data, predicting time to progression, the likelihood uh, that a treatment will be successful, as well as subtyping and clustering diseases. And increasingly, people have been studying these questions 
by combining different data modalities, including genetics, uh, imaging, lab tests, as well as clinical notes. So all of this is to say that there's a lot more exciting work to be done in this intersectional area. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. This is wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Um, I have just a quick question about the model complexity. Basically, you know, there's this new realization in machine learning that the sort of more parameters in a way, the better rather than the worst. Have you sort of played with different model capacities to sort of see, you know, what's really uh, there to learn beyond just the sort of simplest level of the model? Yeah, so um, we tried variations of the model where uh, essentially we created copies of these treatment effect functions. And so instead of three, we had six, uh, nine and 12 to, to ask what happens as we just dramatically increase the complexity of the model. We found that at, there was a point at which like having copies of these treatment effect functions didn't seem to make too much of a difference. And at, uh, after adding a lot of them, it seemed to hurt. Um, we also tried removing some of these treatment effect functions, which is to say we uh, went down from three to two because, I mean, that's about as far as we could go. Um, and we found that there was uh, some drop in performance, but it still outperformed uh, the linear model. And so I think the question of generalization is one we want to revisit again on this larger cohort uh, with the VA, because there I think some of these questions can be determined. Uh, we don't have to worry as much about some of the statistical issues that we had to handle when working with this data. All right. Well, uh, please join me, everyone, in thanking uh, Rahul again for a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer if there's any questions in chat. Perfect. So yeah, basically, if uh, you guys have to um, sort of type questions in the chat, Rahul will stick around.